I want to welcome every one of you. We're welcoming our friends who are watching us online from home. We're so great. We've had a great time already in church today, haven't we? But we have a, a word that we want to continue from last week. If you were here with us, if not, you can uh, watch it online. But we talked last week about the three ways to steward our freedom. Now, what was last Sunday? There's a reason why we preached on that. It was the 4th of July, wasn't it? Right. And so that's a day when we think about our liberties and we think about our freedom. And it was a day just to pause and be thankful for God's blessing upon us. And we, we talked about stewardship because stewardship, if you look it up in the Webster Dictionary, it means to manage something that doesn't belong to you. Or it could mean serving like the steward on a train. So we are stewards of freedom and liberty, and we are grateful, and we are managers. And we talked about three ways last week to steward. Who remembers them? What's the first thing we do? To, so we, we need to acknowledge what? That all our freedoms come from the government. All our freedoms come from another person. No, all our freedoms come from God. All right? And remember in John 8, Jesus was talking to the Jewish people who had gathered around, and he, he declared that uh, it was the truth, he wanted them to believe in the truth, and he said, this truth will make you free. And remember, they objected, and they said something kind of strange. I mean, these were people who followed the Jewish faith, and they said, what are you talking about being free? We've never been in bondage to anyone. Anybody find that a little humorous? Somebody forgot their history, didn't they? They were in bondage all the time, weren't they? But you know what Jesus was telling them? Unless you're free in me, you're not free. Listen, church, you can live in the land of the free. You can be the freest person on the planet and not be free. Unless you understand the freedom that Christ is offering to us. What's the second way to steward our liberty last week? We, we must remember that these gifts... These, this freedom is a gift, and we are to treat it as a gift of God's grace, not just a right. The problem is when we think it's a right, we get a spirit of entitlement on us. And you know what the problem with entitlement is? We're not appreciative. We're not thankful for what we have. It's owed me. All right. I want you to know today that if you're going to steward, if you're going to manage this freedom properly, you must see it as a gift of God's grace to you. And what was the third thing we closed with last week? Very important. If we're going to steward these freedoms properly, we must recognize that we have a personal responsibility with that freedom. God is calling us to respond in certain ways. So today, we're going to take the next step. We're just going to add one word to the, to the title for this week. We're going to talk about three more ways <laughs> to steward our freedom. Three additional ways, three other ways that we can steward our freedom. And since we're just coming off the, the weekend, how many of you had a great, did you have a great time, Independence Day? Were you safe? You know, you didn't blow up anything you shouldn't, right? Did you have some barbecues? Man, it was great, wasn't it? I just love that holiday. It's so much fun. But listen, it's a day to remember the great freedoms that God has given to us. And as we, as I, that weekend causes me to reflect, of course, on the most well-known words of our Declaration of Independence. It's 245 years old. And you probably learned this in school, didn't you? That we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are, say them with me, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are great words, aren't they? And this document is unique, it's special. In fact, we learned last week, you can listen to the message if you didn't get a chance, but the Chicago, the Chicago University, the School of Law, did a research on constitutions and documents like our Declaration of Independence. And remember, they found that the average document like this only lasts 17 years. And the medium age is eight to seven years. Our document has stood for 245 years. That means this is something special. It's something special. And the words that were penned, I believe they're unique. And, and we wanna look at them today through a kingdom perspective 
Now, I want to also acknowledge our founding fathers were just like you and me. They were sinners who had fallen short of the grace of God. They were broken men like we are broken. And oftentimes we criticize them for their sin, but the reality is they came just like us, and yet God used them to pin some words that, listen, words that they were not really able to apply yet in a response. There were, the application of their words was flawed. I mean, think about it. All men created equal. We didn't really come to grips with that right away, did we? Because some of these own slaves. So it's easy to look at our founding fathers and see where they're flawed and broken, and later we would come to grips with some of these things. But here's the reality. What our founding fathers believed about faith and freedom caused God's grace and mercy to rest upon this land. And God has used the United States of America to bless the world over these many years. Now, some would have you believe it's all over now. We're going to, you know, those, the glory days are gone. I don't think so. I think if we still come to the place of faith and liberty and understand God's role in our lives, in spite of our sins, in spite of our flaws, God still wants to use us. He wants to use the church. He wants to use this nation. And as I think about these words, I couldn't help but think about them from a kingdom perspective because I believe that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is God's heart for you. And the way I want you to understand is think about the opposites of those words. This will help put it in perspective. What's the opposite of life? Death. What's the opposite of liberty? Bondage. What's the opposite of happiness? Sadness, right? A lack of joy, a lack of purpose and fulfillment. I believe God's heart for us is that we as believers would have life, liberty, and we would have a purpose, a pursuit in our life that would be godly and kingdom, all right? So I want you to keep that in mind. And as I think about that, I think about a familiar story in John 11. You know the story well. Jesus has just gotten word that his friend Lazarus is sick. And so he, uh, he packed up right away and left. No, he didn't do that, did he? For some reason, he delayed. He received the news, but he didn't go. He delayed, and eventually, he went to see Martha and Mary, and Lazarus was dead. And Martha met Jesus, and you can imagine, she was a little upset because she said, Master, if you'd have been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Why did you wait so long to come? And now here he's dead. And Jesus said to her, hey, listen, I'm the resurrection and the life. And she said, yes, I know, I know that in the, you know, in the last day we'll rise again. He said, no, you don't understand. I am the resurrection and the life. And so they all went out to the tomb where Lazarus was, and he told the crowd, he said, listen, I want you to roll this, this stone away. And of course, everybody objected to that. Why? Because he'd been dead a while. They said, that won't be good. The odor, the smell. They didn't embalm people back then. This would not be a, this is not something we should probably do. Jesus said, hey, oh, take this Take the stone away, and here are the words. We'll put them on the screen for you that Jesus spoke. I like the way the New Living Translation puts it. It says, he shouted. He shouted, Lazarus, come forth. Come out. And the dead man came out, and his hands and his feet were bound in grave clothes, and his face was wrapped in a head cloth. And then Jesus turned to the crowd, and he said, loose him, unwrap him, and let him Go. Do you see in this story all the elements, death, bondage, joylessness, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness? I want you to think about this for a minute. When Lazarus came out of that tomb, he was alive as alive could be. Blood was pumping through his veins. He was sucking that oxygen. He, his heart was, he was alive, but he was not free. It's one thing to have life. It's another thing to have liberty. Because, see, he couldn't see. He couldn't hear. He couldn't walk right. He kind of had to, he could just kind of waddle. But he couldn't, he wasn't free to live. He couldn't take his hands and grasp and hug someone. But he was alive. He was just as alive as he would ever be. 
As I think about that story, I think about us. And I see sometimes in the church, we are alive, we are born again, we have this new life in Christ, but we're in bondage. We keep our grave clothes on. And I also think it's interesting that Jesus turns to the crowd and asks them to loose him. I think we have a ministry to one another in freedom and liberty, don't we? I think, yeah, why didn't Jesus do it? He said, that's your job. You go over there and loose him. Because otherwise, he would have still been alive, but he would not have been able to enjoy life. Because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That picture is life, but it's not abundant life until you can get rid of those things that put us in bondage. Now, the question today is, what, what do you have in your life? I mean, you're alive. I'm not questioning that. What I'm questioning is, are you bound up? Do you, st- are you still got your grave clothes on? I believe God's calling us not just to life, but he's calling us to liberty. He wants us to be free, Amen. He wants us to be free. Now, I want to share with you a New Testament scripture, which is your story and mine, and it's just like Lazarus. In Colossians 2, 13 through 15, here's what's recorded by the Apostle Paul. It was his first imprisonment in Rome, and he pins these words to the early church. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. You see it? Just like Lazarus, right? God called you forth. Do you remember when he called your name? He called, He made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, and he has nailed it to the cross. Do you understand this? Yeah. And I love verse 15. Don't leave it out. And having disarmed powers and principalities and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This is your declaration of independence right here. And it's more than 245 years old, let me tell you. Christ has wrote this into into his plan for us as his church, and we are free today. We were dead, and now we're alive. But the problem is, and I I just can imagine this. Now, if you come to my house, my bathroom's downstairs. Connie's bathroom's upstairs. My bathroom down. This scripture is pasted on the wall because I want to read it every morning because I want to remember who I am in Christ and what God has done for me. I had this thought the other day that what was it like in hell when Jesus arose from the dead? I could just see the demons going, we blew it. Something didn't work out the way we planned it, Right? Now, Christ has died. His blood's been shedding. People, people's sins are forgiven. This is not what we, we wanted to put an end to this. And it looks like we set the thing on fire. Amen. And I could just see the devil saying to the demons, you're right, we did mess up. But we still got an ace in the hole. We just need to convince believers that they're really not free. We can't make, we, we can't, that life thing is, it is what it is. But, but if we could convince them that they're not really alive, if we could bind them up in their grave clothes and get them not to believe that this liberty they have in Christ is real, they'll never pursue happiness. They'll ne- they won't have any joy in their life. Hello? I believe Christians should be the happiest, most joyful people on the planet. Why? Because of life and liberty. We've been set free. This is it. You need to get that and put it on your bathroom. Stick it on the mirror if you have to so you can't miss it every morning and read it. Now, last week we closed with two scriptures. Look at them real quickly. Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Do you see your responsibility there? This is what the enemy's up to, right? We Listen, stand firm. Don't let anyone put that yoke of slavery on you. That's what all of hell wants to do because if you really grasp a hold of your liberty, then you're going to be free to live for God. You, wow, think of all the opportunities. Are, and the enemy knows we, we got to put a yoke of bondage on them again. They're, they're alive in Christ. We can't do anything about that. But we, we can paralyze them. We can, we, can, we can bind them up. 
Paul said in Galatians, stand firm. Don't let that happen. And in verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And you're going to see that word come up over and over again today. All right? Humbly. Now, between those two verses is our first point. Here's the next way to steward your liberty. This is very important. Avoid legalism and license. Avoid legalism and license. Now, legalism and license, it's like the, the ditches on the side of the road. The road is your liberty. It's your freedom that Christ has purchased for you. The enemy wants you to swerve off that road, and he wants you to get into the ditch. He either wants you to get into the ditch of legalism, or he wants you to get into the ditch of license, all right? Stay out of those ditches. Let's read Galatians 5. Let's see the words that were written between those two verses. He starts out, as we know, you were set free for freedom's sake. Don't let yourself be put in a yoke of slavery. And then he begins to describe how they're doing it. Now, this doesn't necessarily apply to us today as far as detail, but the spirit of it is there. They had this issue of circumcision. And the Jewish people who came out of the Jewish faith came back into the church and they said, look, if you're really going to be in right standing with God, if you're really going to follow God, you got to be circumcised, all right? And here's what Paul had to say about that. He said, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. What's he saying? If you put yourself back under the law and under works, you're canceling out what Christ has done and your liberty and freedom. Again, he says, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You are trying to be justified by the law, have been alienated from Christ. You have, ooh, this is hard, this is hard. You have fallen away from grace. Ooh. You see, you see, you're going back to square one. You, can't, you weren't saved by works. You were saved by grace through faith. For though the Spirit, through the, for though, for through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself, here it is again, through love. And then he gets this image. He says, you are running so good. Who cut in on you? Who cut on you? Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Imagine you're running in a race and some runners come up alongside you and they kind of push you over out of the other lane or they box you in. They'll do that sometimes and they'll slow you. He said, who did that to you? You were running so good. That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And here we know this phrase, and a little yeast will leaven the whole lump. A little Yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Let me tell you something. A little bit of legalism is all it takes. Just a little bit. And that's how the enemy is so clever. Just insert a little bit. You get up in the morning, what's the first thing you think about? You think about all the things you did wrong? Think about all your failures and shortcomings? Or do you think, I am accepted by God? Perfectly loved and accepted by God. Do you, you realize how important that is? If you, if that is your starting place, but the enemy, he subtly wants. Well, listen, you're not. You, if you're not a very good Christian, or you wouldn't have done that, or you wouldn't have done that. And we become very focused on these issues of, of failure. And we, we need to remember that don't let the enemy. He's, this is what he knows. He can't stop this, so he wants to try. He wants to put some grave clothes around you. He wants to tie you up. I, just to be real transparent with you, I sinned against my wife this week. I said some things to her I shouldn't have said, and I realized when I did it, I hurt her deeply. And, and I was like, oh, man. And you know, the enemy all, and she forgave me, gracious. But you know, the enemy worked on me, yeah. kept telling me what a scumbag I was, and what a terrible husband I am, and you have no business being a pastor. You shouldn't be pastoring people and leading people and saying things like that to your spouse. See how it works? Yeah. He wants to get just a little bit in there because here's the reality. Hey, I'm loved, yes. and I'm accepted, 
by God, even in all my weakness, all right? Do you understand this? You you see what we're talking about? Galatians 3, 1 through 14. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ has clearly, he was clearly portrayed as crucified. Oh, can I back up a minute? We, We didn't look at verse 7 and 8. This is important. He said, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you, all right? Kind of, but he's talking about, hey, listen, you're not under the curse anymore, all right? It's not how you start, it's how you finish, all right? That's what he's talking about. Then Galatians 3. I would like, I would like you to learn just one thing. I would like to learn one thing from you. I just have one question. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the spirit, you are now trying to finish by means of the flesh? That would be like Lazarus coming out of the grave and they'd take the grave clothes off of him and then he goes back again. That would be a foolish thing, wouldn't it? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, curses everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. This is important. See, what is the curse of the law? The curse of the law is works. It's works. You've been delivered from that. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will have to live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Have you figured out yet? You cannot keep the law. God knew that. Jesus comes. Here's the deal. Have you ever wondered about this? Here's Adam's sins and his sins are applied to me. How many think that's not fair? It's not fair. Why would one man's sin be put on me? Well, just relax a little bit because here's the, if that's true, then my sins are put on Christ, and Christ's righteousness is put on me. Because if one man can bring sin, one man can bring righteousness. So that's all right. That's not fair either, but I'm sure glad for it. How about you? By one man sin came, by one man life came in righteousness, and it is mine. It's through grace alone. Curse is everyone who hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Listen, folks, here, here's the reality. You are not going to stand before God someday on your own self-righteousness. If that's your plan, you need a new plan. I could just see myself going before God and saying, listen, God, I, I, was, I was pretty good. In fact, I was real God. I was a good pastor. I took care of people. I was, re- I was really good. I did mess up with my wife last week, but most of the time I was a good husband. If you're going to stand on your self-righteousness, if you're going to stand in your holiness, if you're going to stand in the justice of God, and, and you're going to stand there and say, let me... You're going to be disappointed. The only thing that's going to help you stand in that place is that you're standing in the righteousness of God by Christ Jesus. Adam's sin was imputed to me. My sin was imputed to Christ. Christ's righteousness is imputed to me. Is anybody a little bit excited about that? (laughs) Two people. First Corinthians 10, 23 through 33. Uh, I don't know if I got time to read all of this, but let, let's look at a little bit this whole idea. Whew. License. I understand legalism. So, you know, got to be good enough, got to measure up. But what about license? Some people have you believe that when you become a Christian, you can You can just do whatever you want with no consequence. That's from hell. It's not true. Now, I will tell you this. You are secure in your salvation, and you're probably not going to die sinless. I I was raised in an environment where if you died and you had unforgiveness in your heart, you're going to hell. Man, that... You can never be confident in your salvation. 
I mean, we went so far as if you were at the movies and Jesus came back, you'd be left behind, right? You know, anybody raised in that environment? Well, you didn't go bowling either because they served beer there. There's something in our DNA that wants to do that. It wants to make it all about these works. Yet, on the other side of the road, the other ditch is, I can sin and just do whatever I want to do, and it doesn't matter. I want you to know it does matter. It does matter. And Jesus, he, he sets you free not just from something, but for something. And he wants to change your life. I didn't say you're going to be perfect. I said you're going to be changed. How many here are changed? How many are not what you used to be? Huh? Yeah? Gee, how'd that happen? Did you do that on your own? Well, you just willed it, didn't you? I'm just going to be different. I am a different person. I like telling stories about my past and people saying, I can't believe that. Good. I know it's hard to believe, but it is true. But God changed me, see? And, that, and, and so this, he, he came into my life and he set me free. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Doesn't mean I don't have conflict with this sinful nature, but I'm no longer a slave to sin. And, and here in, in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 23, he, he says this. Let me get to it here so I can read it properly to you. It's really talking about liberty. He says, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Hang on here. <laughs> all things, he said, are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. No, no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Now, he's getting ready to talk about meat offered to idols. And here's what happened in that day and age. See, uh, Oftentimes, you would, there would be meat offered to idols in worship, and then they'd sell it in the marketplace. And a good, faithful follower would say, we can't eat that meat. If it's been offered to idols, it's unclean. And, and Paul says, well, listen, if somebody invites you over for dinner, don't ask questions about the meat. Just eat whatever's set before you, right? But he's, he, he's talk, he says here, you are free... You are free. You can do whatever you want. But that's not the question. The question is can, not can I do is it? Does it edify? Does it build up? Will it master me? See, we're asking the wrong questions. In liberty, I am free. I can do a lot of things. But should I? That's the real question. So watch out for this spirit of license. Let's quickly go to number two because we're going to run out of time here. Uh, never separate Love from liberty. Never separate love from liberty. This is so important. True liberty always has love attached to it. True love always has liberty attached to it. That's what happened with my wife and I this week. I was trying to take her liberty away from her and, and call it love. No. If you really love somebody, then they're free. If somebody's manipulating you or somebody's shaming you, that's not love. Because there's no liberty there, see? Love always brings the spirit of liberty. John 3, 16, we know it well, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So it's love, it's God's love that caused this transaction to take place where Jesus came, it's out of love. He came and offered himself. What was he offering us? He was offering us liberty, wasn't he? He was offering us freedom. In fact, you got to read the next verse, right? He didn't come in the world to condemn the world, but he came in the world that the world might be saved. He's talking about life and liberty, isn't he? And he's saying it all because of love. When there's love, there's liberty. If there's no liberty, there's no love. Do you understand? This is what God is calling us to. In 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 13, he said, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, you, with all your knowledge, eating at the idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? And he goes on to explain, you know, that, hey, we're not, it's not, you, you, he, he's saying that love will always trump liberty. You can do this, but should you? And then he says these words, this, these words blow me away. He says, therefore, if meat offends my brother, I will never eat it again. Can he eat it? Yeah. Should he eat it? 
Love says no. Love always trumps liberty. Love is always present when there is liberty. 1 Corinthians 9.19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. What's the context of that verse? Well, he was talking about taking, we would call it salary. He was a minister, and ministers lived by the table, right? And Paul said, I have the right to do that. I can do that, but I choose not to do that. I'm going to lay down that right. I'm going to lay down that liberty for the benefit of the gospel, that the gospel might not be spoken evil of. Do you see love is present there in liberty? Liberty without love, it's a strange thing. It's manipulation, intimidation. We don't, uh, giving can be that way. You ever been in a church where it takes 30 minutes to take the offering? What's that about? Manipulation, t- listen, you're free. You are free. I'm not going to, if I try to intimidate you, run the other way. If I try to manipulate you, run the other way. Because liberty is present when love is present. Do you understand? True liberty cannot exist apart from love. And true love cannot exist apart from liberty. In Romans 14, same thing. He, He talks about letting love trump liberty and not don't destroy another man by your food. He said, listen, don't walk in love. Always walk in love. And he says, pursue peace. He said, the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but peace, righteousness. Oh, man, in the Holy Spirit. Wow, this is, this is what makes up the liberty that God has given to us. And we need to be careful, he says. Be careful that you're walking in love. Pursue peace. What the founding father said, pursue happiness. I believe you can do that by pursuing peace. What is it you're chasing after? What is it you want? Well, if you come from a place of life and liberty, I believe love is, is going to trumpet and it's going to cause you to live a certain way. First John 4, 7 and 8. I had this song in my, in my brain this weekend. I kept singing it to Connie, asking her if she remembered it. She said she didn't. And, but you might remember it when you're in Sunday school, you know. Beloved, let us love one another. Did you remember that song? Anybody? A few of you. Okay. I couldn't get it out of my head. It just kept, so I wrote it down here. I thought, you know, it's true. Think about this. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, now, hang on. I'm not saying you're not saved if you don't love people. I'm saying you don't know God. Oh, I did say that. Sorry. Taking credit for something John said. Did he mean it? John 17, 3, not on the screen. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that you know God that you know God, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Listen, it's about knowing God. If we really know, we're talking about intimacy, we're talking about a relationship here with God. If you really know God, this is a natural result. If you don't love, you need to know God more. God's calling you in to a place of intimacy with him. Do you understand? Because law, because liberty and love, they go together. They're just automatic. Are you seeing this at all? Let God speak to your heart about this. This is so, so important. You cannot separate. People have liberty without love. No such thing. Any more than you can have love without liberty. No such thing. How about the third point? Very important. Never, never separate. I'm sorry. Always walk in the Holy Spirit's wisdom and fruit. Now, this is where we, of course, started weeks ago. But this, this, if you want to know how to steward your liberty, your freedom, one of the ways you do that is to filter it through Galatians. Galatians is the book of freedom. And, and remember, Paul said, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Remember, he also said, if you, walk in, if you live in the Spirit, then walk in the Spirit. Anybody see Lazarus? If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things. Anybody see there? That's all about relationships, isn't it? It's all about relationships. So when we're walking in our liberty, what was it Paul said in Galatians? Don't use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but use your liberty to serve 
one another. How? What do you say? In the humility of love. It keeps coming back to that. Love is the engine of liberty, isn't it? And the, the fruit of the Spirit, is it present? In our, are these are the things that automatically come to the surface in our lives. They should be. Think about it. Look at them. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passion and desire of their sinful nature to this cross, and they have crucified them there. Anybody notice that's something you do? You do that. You reckon that's so. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And what about James 3? This is the wisdom that comes from above. It is expressed through our liberty and our love. Listen to this. But the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. This is not peace we get. This is from God, from heaven, from the Holy Spirit. This wisdom that God said, if you lack wisdom, ask. He'll give it to you liberally without reproach. Here it is. This wisdom is pure. It's peace-loving. It's gentle at all times. It's willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Do you see it? Do you see it? This is the wisdom that comes from above. And our liberty is an opportunity to express that. And so we walk in wisdom. We walk in the fruit of the Spirit. We walk in it through, and we serve one another in the humility of love. How else can we do things like love your enemies and do good to those who spitefully use you? Who, you're going to do that in the flesh? I think that's part of your liberty. So let's think about it again. This is, this is what God's desiring for us. He wants you to have life. He wants you to have liberty. And he wants you to pursue happiness and joy and purpose in your life. I believe that's the heart of God for you. I believe that's why this document is 245 years old, because it actually represents the heart of God for a nation. And I, I believe God could still, still wants to do that in and among us. Amen. So we're going to come to the table this morning. We're going to start with that verse that we started with weeks ago. This, as you come, this is the table of freedom. This is where our freedom lies, right here in this cup and bread. It is for this freedom that Christ has set us free. So I'm calling you today to stand firm. And do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't let yourself be bound up again. Stay out of the ditches of legalism and license. Realize that you have been saved for a purpose. Amen? Stay out of the ditches. Allow God to work in you and don't separate your love from your liberty. Walk in God's love. Know God. That's, that's, he's drawing us into a relationship with him so that we can walk in this love and that we can walk in Holy Spirit wisdom and fruit. And by doing that, we will be standing firm and not allowing the enemy to put us back into the yoke of slavery because that's the only response he has to what Christ has done. And we don't have to listen to him. I believe God's calling us to come to the place where we can realize we are fully loved and accepted by him. There is a scripture we often misuse. It says, perfect love casts out all fear. Does anybody know the context of that scripture? We always say, well, you know, love is perfect, cast you won't be afraid. That scripture is in the context of judgment, standing for God someday. And when you stand before God, you'll be standing in perfect love, and you will not be afraid. You will not be afraid, because perfect love, you've been loved perfectly by God, and you don't earn it. You can't perform your way into it. You won't perform your way out of it. God loves you, and he receives you. And I believe from that, your life will change. It will be different. And you'll be able to walk out your liberty. You won't have to stay all bound up in your grave clothes. But you can be free. You can be free. Somebody here today needs to know God wants you to be free. And I'm here to loose you. I'm here to loose you. You can walk out of here and leave your grave clothes here. And just receive the liberty and life that God's given. And then you can pursue the things of God. I know the world's a dark place. But that's a perfect place to live out your liberty. Perfect place. Father, as we come to this table this morning, we, we, are, we want to be reminded, I pray you magnify it to us today, how free we are in you. 
that we are not standing here by our works, but we're standing here by the works that you've done. It's not what we did, it's what you have done for us. But because of us entering into that life, we now have liberty. We have liberty to live our lives freely, expressing your glory wherever we go and pursuing the purposes and the plans that you have for us in our lives. And to know the joy that no one can take from us, a delight in you that is not affected by pain or pleasure. Father, we want to know that today. You made that declaration a long time ago, even before our founding fathers did. And we want to walk in it today. Would you help us do that? There's some people here today who need to be free. I pray you will speak words of life to them. But more than that, remove those things that have kept them in bondage so they can live live free as you purpose for them to do. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. As I invite you to the table this morning, I want to give this invitation. If you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus, you've never said, you know, yeah, I want to trust in what the work that Jesus did, what you're saying, I've never trusted in that, that he's forgiven my sins and that he wants to set me free. I've never, I've never taken that step, but I feel today like I want to. There's no card to sign. There's, there's no special prayer to pray other than, do you believe that Jesus has done this for you and that he loves you and he wants to accept you just like you are. You don't get cleaned up first. You come as you are and then God begins to work in your life. Amen. And it's not, it's not bait and switch. It's not bait and switch, you know. You say, oh, just come just like you are and then we'll put you under the thumb and we'll make you jump through all these. No, no, no. No, no, no. When, he met, when Jesus sets you free, you're free. Indeed. Amen. If you're here today and and you've never done that, I'm going to give you a strange invitation. I'm going to invite you to come and take communion, to take the cup and the bread, maybe for the very first time. And as you take it and you think about what it represents and you can say, I want to trust in this. I want to trust that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, shed his blood so my sins could be forgiven, rose again, so I too can rise, raise a newness of life. I believe that. I'm going to put my trust in that. Then I'm going to invite you to come to the table and take it for the very first time. And then I want to pray with you later, if that's you. Amen. Maybe somebody drug you here. I don't know. <laughs> but God brought you here for a purpose today. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Father. We, we love you. We love each other. We come to this table. And we declare our freedom today. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to come down the center aisle, make your way to the side table, take the cup and bread, return to your seat again, and we'll receive it together. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. Lift your eyes to heaven, there is freedom. When you lift your eyes to heaven, there is freedom. And we know that freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace Falling down on every face There is freedom And Jesus reigns in this place With showers of mercy and grace and it's falling down on every face there is freedom lord we are just amazed at what this represents to us this is the bread of freedom you were broken so we could be whole and well 
by your stripes. We are healed, body, soul, and spirit. Thank you, Father. The most important healing of all is our hearts. And you have breathed into us this life and liberty. Thank you. We want to pursue your kingdom and your peace in everything we do and say. And this made it possible. We thank you for the, the cup and the blood. And you said it was the new covenant. You shed it for us that our sins could be forgiven. All our sins, all our sins are under this blood covering and we don't take that for granted and we thank you for it. Now let us walk free from it. Don't let the enemy put us again into bondage, but let us walk free that we might live to your glory. Thank you, we are no longer slaves. No longer are we slaves. And we're not under the bondage of sin anymore, but we are free. Let us walk it out. We don't want to just live in the spirit, we want to walk in the spirit. We want to be free to live our lives to your glory, and we, this makes it possible. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, please. We make this declaration today that we will stand firm. But now we want to take that next step as we prepare to leave. And that's verse 13. Let it burn in your hearts, brothers and sisters. We're called to be free. We're not going to use our freedom to indulge the flesh. But rather, we're going to serve one another humbly in love. That is your mission and calling as you leave this service today. Make a commitment to do that this week, would you? You're free. You're free. But use it to serve others in love. Remember, you can't separate love from liberty or liberty from love. So this is your opportunity to live out what God has given to you. Amen. I just see that in the story when Jesus says, loose him. That's our job. I want you to go out this week and loose some people. You're going to see them say, hey, I'm here to loose you. I'm here to help you. Because sometimes we need help in that. Is that true? Could Lazarus not do that by himself? No, unless he, uh, he needed help. And I need help, you need help. And so that's the purpose of the body of Christ. One of the ways we will serve one another humbly in love. Amen. So the invitation stands as we get ready to leave this place. We'll, we'll stay to pray with you. If, if you made a decision to trust Christ today and to become a follower of Jesus, I want to pray with you. If you're here today, you need healing in your body. We will anoint you with oil. We'll pray the prayer of faith over you. If you need encouragement, or maybe you just need, you need to help and encouragement to walk in your freedom today. Maybe you just need to come up so we can help you get out of some of those grave clothes. We'd love to do that. Now that might not happen in this service, so feel free this week. We can connect. We can get together with you. And it might it might not be one and done. It might be several times together, but I believe, I believe with all my heart, God wants you to be free. Amen. He wants you to walk in it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Father, bless this church. I love these folks and they love me. And that's because we know you. We know you, God, and you are loving through us to each other. And so we thank you for that. Help us use our liberty to magnify that love in our midst. Lord, go, uh, just go with us as we fulfill this great commission here to serve others uh, humbly in love. Help us do that, would you? We love you. We love each other. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Go in God's love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We must sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that.